Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to the undergraduate webinar series, an interactive online platform connecting high school students to the Ashoka community. In this series, we cover topics related to um, Ashoka's undergraduate research program, where our academic counselors, students, and faculty guide you in understanding the various aspects of the university. Thank you all for joining us today for the webinar, Computer Science at Ashoka. My name is Medni Chopra. I'm a third year computer science major and performing arts minor, as well as the co-president of the Computer Science Society at Ashoka. Joining me today is Professor Debayan Gupta. He is an assistant professor of computer science at Ashoka University and also a visiting professor and research affiliate at MIT and MIT Sloan. Before coming to Ashoka, Professor Debayan held an extraordinary faculty position in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. He has a PhD from Yale and a bachelor's degree from St. Xavier's College, Kolkata. Thank you for joining us today, Professor. It's Without a pleasure. Further, Thank you. Um, before we begin, I would request our audience to kindly type any questions they might have in the Q&A box provided on your Zoom screen, and we will address them towards the end of the session. All right, great. Thank you so much, Medini, for that very kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to take this in a certain way. I'm going to talk you through how computer science works at a place like Ashoka, how it is different from, let's say, a traditional engineering degree and so on and so forth. Um, what will be very useful, and uh, this is my request to all the attendees, is um, please do use the Q&A system, as Medini said, uh, to ask questions. If you have things that are, uh, there may be slides where I'm talking about something and it's not clear, please ask the question at the time. I'll pause and I'll try and explain it. I'll try and keep an eye on your questions in real time, okay? So I'm not gonna wait. We'll, we'll do a proper detailed Q&A at the end of the session also, but I, I'll try, as best I can uh, to keep uh, to the current slide as well. So let me just um, open up my screen share and then we'll get started. Just give me a second. Um, Maitani, could you confirm that you can see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And could you also confirm that it goes to the next slide? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, many of you are students, some of you will be parents, and presumably you are considering uh, getting into either Ashoka or a place like Ashoka in India um, as part of your higher studies, of your or your child's higher studies. And as you're going through this, you will have come across the same things all of us have. When I was applying for my higher studies and I chose computer science because I didn't really like anything else. I was pretty bored with uh, all my other subjects at the time. Um, there was a certain hierarchy that was presented to me, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, we have a sort of pyramid of subjects in India, right? Way at the tippy top of that pyramid are sort of the mathematically hi-fi subjects, right? So someone studying sciences, physics, chemistry, computer science, these are all the people who did well in school, right? Um, then the idea is if you didn't get into sciences and the science stream when you got into class 10, 11, uh, then you probably went ahead and chose the humanities and so on and so forth. And if you hear about someone who's, let's say, studying dance or something, you're like, oh my God, what happened to this person, right? There's a, there's a certain hierarchy that is nestled deep within our brains. Um, now, that is not to say that that hierarchy is with entirely without merit. It is true that there was a time and some of that still persists, that having educated oneself or one's child in some of these areas generally led to significantly 
higher quality outcomes in terms of life satisfaction and in terms of your uh, sort of amount of money made as well uh, in your future. What I hope to convince you of is that, you know, we keep telling each other, oh, the world has changed so much. 25 years ago, we didn't really have that many people with mobile phones. Now it's everywhere. You know, Google Maps, social media, this, that, and the other. The world is changing. What has changed most of all is our future, is the future of learning and education and how we operate and how jobs are going to operate. And given that future, that old way of thinking that hierarchy, these subjects are the useful uh, ones, that has completely broken down. So let me give you an idea of what we have been doing wrong, okay? Uh, for the longest time, India had some very, very good people and very good students, um, but only up to the undergraduate level. We had all these wonderful people, incredible students who, you know, IITs, IIMs coming first, coming, sort of getting these prizes, gold medal, blah, blah, blah. But the only way they could achieve anything was by leaving India, heading off to Berkeley or Imperial or wherever else. And those same people who were not, shall we say, publishing so many papers in India are doing very well here. They were getting the awards, but they were not actually accomplishing the science, so to speak. Uh, suddenly when they go abroad, they flourish. And we've seen this, this, this we, we labeled this movement itself, the brain drain, as you all know. But there was a reason for it. What is it that we were doing wrong? If you go over to IIT Bombay today, to even today, the people sitting there aren't duffers, okay? They are extremely clever people. But we're clearly doing something wrong because as you'll notice, when, I mean, rankings aren't the best way to look at the world. But if you look at whatever rankings, we have very, very, very few Indian universities in the top few rankings. We are now, there's newspaper articles talking about why are these people not in the top 100 and why should we be satisfied with the top 100? We have 1.3, 1.4 billion people. We should have multiple universities in the top 10, right? We should have two or three universities in the top 10 universities in the world. We as a culture, Indians across North, South, East, West, everywhere, we put a lot of value into our education. Parents spend so much money, even from childhood, into sending kids to tuitions, this, that, and the other. With all of that effort, all of that cultural background, all of these high-quality institutions, why is it that even after all of this, we are not being able to produce high-quality output? And it is a fact. Why is it a fact? You can look at it this way. If you look at the number of patents per capita, it is pathetic even adjusting for the number of students only in universities, because the conversion rate for people to universities is also pretty low in India. If you look at high quality conferences and journal publications that take place from India, it's a complete joke. The moment, I, I, can, I will tell you, if my student wants to go to a conference or wants to publish a paper at a journal or a conference or something, and they say, oh, it's taking place in Pune, I'll be like, don't, it's probably a predatory, it's a, it's a jolly conference, something wrong is happening. Because all of these places are just fraudulent. Why is that popular? Why is that perception there? Right? We have clearly been doing something wrong. And that something wrong is what prompted many of the founders. You know, there's a bunch of people on our university leadership page. These, these were all people, you know, people like me would call them NRI types, but there was a there were a bunch of people who got together and they figured that, you know. The US is one country that seems to have done this right. Can we try and understand what they did right and create a version of that for India? Not a copy, because that would never work. And I'll skip the obvious Vivekananda quote. But can we build something that is Indian in nature, but uses those same ideas? And that is where Ashoka was born. Right now, Ashoka has, and, and when I say plus, this is not the um, et cetera plus that students use, right? When I say 2000 plus students, I think it's like more than 2500 or something. And uh, when, when these numbers are not that there's 
201 cities or 26 countries. Like the, the, I'm, I'm giving you a reasonable-ish number. I'm not just sort of skipping over the nearest thing. Um, we've been doing quite well. Why are all these people coming? What are they getting out of it? Um, and especially from the view of computer, from the point of view of something as tech adapted as computer science, what are we doing differently from the average university in India? Right? That's where we are. We're just outside of New Delhi. There's this area called the Rajiv Gandhi Education City. There's a bunch of different universities in this area. We like to think we're the best, but you're welcome to check out the other places also. Right. Um, the first thing that we realized is that you need to have a certain amount of, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry I'm using this phrase, phrase, holistic thinking. Ashoka is a liberal arts university. Now, uh, unfortunately, there is a, uh, people think when, when someone says liberal arts, people think it means studying certain subjects. That is not what the term means. Uh, the average Wikipedia search will immediately reveal that uh, liberal arts involves a particular way of thinking about the world, right? Um, and things like geometry, rhetoric, sciences, all fall within the liberal arts. In fact, all of the top universities across the world you've heard of, whether you're talking about your Harvards, Princeton, Yale's, MIT's, all of these places use a liberal arts style of education. And what that means is if you're studying engineering, studying engineering is not the only thing you do. Right. When you are trying to understand something as new and strange as computer science, a subject which, in my opinion, we've barely begun to scratch the outer layers of, um, it is important to be able to apply those ideas at scale. Now, you'll see on the top right of this set of slide of this slide this thing that is very common in a lot of these kinds of presentations that says CS plus X, right? Uh, it generally means applying computer science to some area. If you're an archeologist, you're using computer science and archeology span to build 3D models of your uh, dig site or something. It is critical to understand that CS plus X does not mean computer science plus the other thing divided by two. Uh, it is, so, you know, Medini can tell you all of us, all of the students who are doing all of these uh, double majors or minors and all of this stuff. It is incredibly hard work. All right. If you, I'm sorry to tell you, those of you who want sort of a relatively easy and well constrained ride where you're saying, okay, I'll be here for four years. I, I come in with an idea. I do a reasonable amount of work. I get out with that degree. That is not what's going to happen to you at Ashoka. Okay. It is, I, uh, the, the entire point of this environment is to force you to explore. All of the CS plus X stuff is you do your entire computer science degree plus a lot of more stuff. It's a tremendous amount of hard work and it's meant to be an incredibly bumpy ride. A lot of the stuff around applying CS to societal issues in a lot of places is very hand wavy. That is not the point. I teach a class on that. It's a lot of hard work. All right. Um, when we're talking about this kind of really hardcore, difficult vision of how do we build the next generation of artificial intelligence systems that have some, some essence of ethics built into it, the AI plus ethics course here is incredibly difficult. Again, this stuff isn't easy. How do we get Indian students up to a level where they can actually interact with this stuff? The answer, unfortunately, is a lot of elbow grease and hard work, because one of the troubles that we've had with, let's say, Indian high schools is barring a few. And these are the good ones are unfortunately mostly only in the cities. Uh, we find a lot of students who have just vaguely learned things. When you're multiplying a matrix, why are you doing row times column? Why not column times row? Well, that's what I was taught. But why? What are you actually doing? No idea. Right? I know if I do this, I will get marks. That's the end of it. Right? Um, when one is dealing with complex real world issues with very difficult outcomes, um, this is no longer a level of thinking that is sufficient. You need to go a lot deeper. 
So for example, recently I was uh, talking to some IS officers in Tamil Nadu and they have a great e-governance initiative. And one of their problems is they're uh, creating all of these uh, water filtration facilities. They have limited amounts of money. So they're, they're saying we'll put out 50,000 of these. Where should we put them so that we produce the most value? What does that mean? Do you find places where there are population centers already? So it affects the most people. Do you find places where there are not population centers because you didn't have enough drinking water? So if you put some there, more people will migrate. Maybe you put them in other places to minimize the amount of uh, pressure that is put on the local water table. What are the things you take into account? How do you write code around all of this? And of course, there's a lot of optimization, operations, research, other stuff that goes on on top of it. Right. So even starting to think at this level of depth requires a lot of hard work. That hopefully is part of the education that we want to provide at Ashoka. And I think we've managed that to some extent. But obviously, this is a never ending thing. A lot more needs to be done. Let me walk you through uh, some of the um, some of the kinds of things we like to do in terms of uh, research. This is important because a lot of uh, universities in India don't really do research. They say they do, but what that means is, you know, one percent of research is happening there. It is my opinion and the opinion of the official opinion of Ashoka as a whole, uh, which reflects the opinion of many of the top schools in the world, that you cannot, especially in a subject like computer science, uh, you cannot teach well without doing research, all right? Because there's this really fun uh, visualization looking at the rate at which new knowledge is produced in these fields. If you're studying an advanced, in, if, you're, if you're doing sort of a high quality computer science degree, on average, about half of what you learned in your first year is out of date by the time you hit your fourth, all right? With this incredible rate of change, uh, forgive the cliche, you, you can't just learn stuff. You need to learn how to learn so that you can keep reskilling yourself constantly. Um, that is incredibly difficult unless you get into research incredibly early, right? Uh, this involves having logistical and monetary support for research for undergraduate students, which is something that we heavily encourage. Um, we have a great deal of, I would like to think, because I teach one of them, uh, high quality interdisciplinary courses. And when I say interdisciplinary, I don't mean that we have, you know, 26 lectures and 10 will have coding and 12 will have some external, no, 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 like actually interdisciplinary stuff. Um, we have a fair number of these courses. Our students love them. Uh, I would like to think that it, is, it has vastly increased the kinds of jobs that they uh, will apply to, because there's a certain kind of student that can, suppose, I, I even though I'm a big believer that computer science is not programming, right? The difference between a mechanic and an automotive engineer. Um, but there's a lot of work that, that gets done by students just learning sort of the coding and related architectural background and so on and so forth. But once you take those same students and you teach them, I mentioned stuff around AI ethics, uh, you teach them, let's say, forensics, you teach them a great deal of background around cryptography, about privacy. Um, there are companies, and I'm, I'm not talking about higher studies right now, I'll get into that a little bit later, um, I'm looking at my students, the kinds of companies they end up working at, you know, three, a couple of years after they graduate, right? And in a lot of cases, they've migrated back, it's really interesting, to the area that they were really interested in, uh, the, the, the sub areas where they were doing research. So there are students who went out, got some sort of temporary, got a consulting job, just because it was high paid. They made some money, two years down the line, they've switched back. Uh, and they're doing this, uh, and then they're doing something, let's say, in uh, healthcare data, which is privacy preserving, because that's what they remember doing that, and they got really interested in it. And uh, this is a shout out to a lot of the parents out there. Um, 
the way people do work right now has changed so much, right? Like, like my father worked in one company for like 30 years, right? Um, that is gone. That is no longer happening. We don't have that much data on India. I'll give you the US equivalent. By the age of 35, the average worker right now has had four jobs, right? And that's just increasing. So part of that is not just sort of, or oh, bad HR and attrition, a lot of that is because people are constantly reskilling. And as they are reskilling, they're moving into new positions that will pay them more for those new skills that they have built. And a lot of those new skills are dependent on the way technology is moving. Think about it this way. If you go back, uh, let's say 10, 15, 20 years, right? Um, if your children are at the age where they are thinking of entering college, think about the time just a couple of years before they were born, right? Um, what were the top jobs in the world at that time? If you think about, by top jobs, I'm talking like, don't, don't, don't think about all of this job satisfaction stuff. I'm saying pure cash, all right? Um, I can tell you, if you asked me to predict what would be the highest paying jobs or most in-demand jobs in 2023 right now, and you asked me this five years ago, 10 years ago, seven years ago, I would have been wrong every single time. Because if you think back about 20 years back, all of these companies, you know, Facebook had just been founded, right? Not, had not even been founded, right? 2002, 2003, right? Uh, Google was just kind of sort of around, but not really. Um, all of the top paying jobs right now, looking at uh, AI ethics engineers, cloud uh, engineers, all of these high paying jobs, nowhere in the story. We were going through an AI winter at the time. All of the people who wanted to specialize in reinforcement learning were told, as one of my colleagues famously told me, that this is, you'll never find a job, switch fields to computer vision or something. Um, the rate at which things are changing is absurd, which means that we have to prepare our children, our learners for jobs 10, 20, 30 years into the future when we have absolutely no idea what the skills in demand will be at that point in time, right? Given this reality, how do we actually create that kind of background, right? Uh, I'll just switch back to a couple of questions that I noticed uh, in the chat. Um, general career path for CS graduates. I can tell you for, so I, I, I don't know for all of my students. I don't have the placement uh, details right in front of me. I can tell you that a large number of my students, especially the ones who complete the four-year degree, actually go ahead to do higher studies, mostly in the US, mostly in the IVs, um, but there's a there's a huge amount of people who do uh, master's degrees and PhDs mainly in the US and the UK, right? Some going to Europe as well, right? So there's a, there's a very large amount of movement towards higher studies. Uh, in terms of placements, I'll, I'll sort of redirect you to the people, uh, to the admins at Ashoka, they, they'll be happy to give you uh, detailed figures around that. Um, but I can tell you that most of my students that I keep in touch with have good, well-paying jobs, right? Actually, not all, pretty much all of them have good, well-paying jobs. They're happy, right? So I don't, uh, while I can't give you figures off of the top of my head, I can tell you that it's not bad, right? Um, now, I'll also quickly... Uh, I, I, there's a couple more questions which I will uh, answer in a couple more slides. So I'll skip the questions about humanity centric stuff and interdisciplinary because I'll answer them in a couple more slides. Okay. Uh, computer science at Ashoka is built upon a certain uh, set of pillars, if you will. Now, there's an actual syllabus and a set of courses. I won't go too much into that. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, it is important to understand that the job of a professor nowadays is no longer to teach. All right. Uh, 
because if people wanted to learn, you have the internet, you can go out, you can find the best lecture that the best professor in the world has provided on a particular subject right now. We don't do that. We use it to watch cat videos or whatever, right? The goal of a professor right now is no longer being a conveyor belt of information, but it is to provide students with sufficient inspiration and a pathway to learn and sufficient information so that they can now follow up on things. That's actually why I was having a discussion about things like ChatGPT. I love it. In some sense, systems like ChatGPT and, you know, if sorry, there's a automatic uh, motion sensor thing here. Um, systems like ChatGPT, they, they are an example that show us what kinds of questions we should not be asking students. Because if students can just go online, grab some stuff, memorize a little bit and write something simple, that is not making them think. That's not making them collate information properly. There are better questions to ask. And remember, you know, something like ChatGPT, for those of you who are, who you are interested in this sort of thing, um, it is only doing basic inductive uh, reasoning, right? It, it is incapable of deductive or abductive reasoning. Um, Data-driven pattern matching only in simple terms. But these pillars that I've described that I've written down, I'm not going to read them out. I'm assuming everyone can read. Um, there's a reason we came up with these. It's because once you understand these basic structures, it be it now becomes possible to follow up by yourself, take elective courses, take harder courses, do other courses online and learn everything you need to learn. We don't think, th th there's an old school way of teaching computer science, right? You, you take certain courses, blah, 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 you learn these things and that's it. Um, that is not very useful uh, because, and then many of us know this, you know, a couple of years after you graduate, you've just completely forgotten everything. That's not what we're after. Why should I spend a lot of effort and you will spend a lot of effort of, attending my class, learning things, you'll learn it. And then two years later, you'll completely forget it, right? So Ashoka, as a university, we tried to make a certain amount of effort. And this is obviously an ongoing process. Uh, hopefully, we've had some success in getting rid or restructuring, at least, a lot of this kind of material that is not truly used. And in answer to one of the other questions that I mentioned, that I uh, saw here, we will teach you from scratch, all right? I don't, if, if you come here with, you know, absolute basic level information about, oh, there's a thing called a computer and you supposedly can code on it and you know nothing else about computers, you can't even use Microsoft Word, I don't care, we'll teach you, all right? Um, so there's a lot of effort put into that, don't worry. You, you will have sufficient, a uh, low level background that is drilled into you if you want it. Okay. Um, let me take a quick break and tell you a little bit about, well, not myself, but the kinds of things that I'm interested in. Um, so by trade, I'm a cryptographer. I do cryptography, computer security, um, but I'm a bit of a magpie personality. When I see something shiny, I tend to focus in on that. Uh, so I spend a lot of time looking at uh, how society and tech interact. How is something like, you know, I'm not going to bring up the obvious sort of Cambridge Analytica style examples, but as we move into a world which is increasingly driven by technology, how does that change the way, let's say, the economy works, right? Uh, especially with multi-platform technologies like, let's say, something like Uber, how does it change the way people move, right? That sort of thing. There's a lot of crossovers I work on. Uh, and I'm also fairly interested in instrumentation. I do a lot of work uh, engineering and building physical devices for high-end uh, biophysics work, essentially. So I do a lot of work with um, something called magnetic tweezer systems. Uh, essentially taking individual protein molecules and using magnetic forces to unfold and put different kinds of forces on proteins. You can think of, if you've seen Star Wars or something, it's like a, a tractor beam, but very, very tiny to sort of manipulate individual protein molecules, that sort of stuff. Um, we actually have 
the best lab in the world for that. Um, I'm not kidding. There used to be a lab at Columbia. That team broke up. They're now at Imperial and Max Planck, but they're not building it anymore. So we, we actually have the best uh, single molecule lab on the planet. Um, so that's actually something I, I, I saw an underlying uh, assumption about this in some of the questions, which is why I mentioned this is, oh, Ashoka has this reputation around humanity stuff only. Maybe you don't do serious scientific work. No, no, no. We're, we're doing a lot of hardcore science. Um, part of the whole point of this, going back to what I mentioned about the IITs and so on, why aren't we succeeding? It's because you can't do science by only doing science. You actually need to understand the other stuff also, right? You, you need to read your poetry and you need to understand why the economy is behaving in a particular way. And you need to learn a little bit of geography and you need to learn a little bit of Shakespeare. Having a single minded focus on something is valuable. It is important. It is not sufficient, right? You need that wide base of thought because that's that inability to see things from a distance is something that has come back to bite Indian science really, really badly. And that's something that we're working on fixing, hopefully, over the decades uh, to come. Let me uh, try and go into some of the uh, other questions that I had anticipated and cleverly made some slides about. Um, we have a fair number of these uh, double majors and minors. So when students come in, they don't need to declare anything. They can if they want to. Uh, but um, let's say someone like Medhani, if she comes in, she's not saying that, hey, I'm going to study physics or something like that. You come in, you take a bunch of these foundation courses and other things. And there's a deadline somewhere in your second year, I believe. Uh, but th th there's a timeline by which you need to say that, okay, this is what I want to do. Now, uh, there's a bit of a line in that, that is you do, you, you, most people have an idea about what they want to do and they may sort of take some of those other courses early and that may bias them, but it really is up to you. You, you can delay things if you're not sure what you want to study. And I actually know a very large number of people. Um, it is not in the majority, but it, it is a very large minority who started out doing X, but went on to do Y, if that makes sense, right? So it's it's fairly common to shift focus over time. And uh, even if one does not change their desired major, a lot of people end up doing double majors or minors. Um, I am more aware of what people do with computer science. A lot of people do entrepreneurship uh, side by side. They also do mathematics. That's an extremely heavy uh, double major to do. Um, there's a fair number of people doing econ. And when it comes to minors, people do minors in a lot of different subjects. And actually, it might be better for you to hear from a student about some of this stuff. Um, and we have a lot of uh, pathways, coursework pathways, sort of which courses to take after which courses to build up these things uh, for many, many, many different uh, kinds of double majors and majors with minors and so on and so forth, right? So it is it is not a, this is very much, if you've uh, encountered, let's say the American system or the Canadian system of education, this is very uh, similar to that, not to the traditional Indian system at all, okay? Um, I won't get so much into the research thing right here. If you have more questions about that, I'll, I'll, I'll come in. Um, but I will say a couple of things because I'm, I'm scrolling through many of the questions as I'm, as I'm seeing them. Um, yes, I do think degrees are necessary. Um, it's like one of those things, uh, oh, uh, you know, as people end up getting certifications and getting good at different things, theoretically speaking, it is completely correct. Degrees should not be necessary anymore. Um, they are still extremely important as a signaling function, right? Um, it shows that you've been through a certain level of rigor. 
Unfortunately, many companies actually will use it as, oh, somebody got into this college and graduated, therefore they're not idiots, and therefore we can retrain them. Companies will have, you know, six-month training periods where they sort of redo the stuff that should have been done in university and so on. It is true. Uh, degrees are still necessary, and for the foreseeable future, they will remain necessary. Theoretically, I understand why someone might ask that question, but one could see the same thing about clothes or something, right? Theoretically, one could only need them in winter, but that's not how we live, right? <laughs> now, uh, don't worry about things like being weak at maths. I found the vast majority of people who think they're strong at maths aren't. Uh, the moment we give them something slightly different from what they've been taught in school, they kind of fall apart. That's not their fault. And it's not your fault if you think you're weak at maths or if you think your child is weak at maths. It is the unfortunate truth that we as a society have completely failed in teaching mathematics at a high school level, right? Take probability, for instance, right? Um, our, uh, what we teach about probability seems to be, you know, count favorable events, divide by the number of, you know, the numerator, denominator, favorable events divided by total number of events, hope to God that this number is between zero and one, right? This is not how probability works at all, because, after your third year, you take an advanced course with me. We start with some quantum computing, and I say, okay, we're going to take this L2 norm and blah, 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 and here's your probability. It, this is now a complex number. And you're like, what? How can probably be, probability be a complex number? Why is it A plus IB? How can a complex number be a probability? It makes no sense, right? And then you'll fall apart and you'll run away from my class. Now, the, this all seems very scary because you've been taught wrong at an early level. There's a lot of stuff that people struggle with. In fact, I, I remember this fairly recently. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Subhan, um, he was taking this introductory computing course, uh, computational thinking sort of uh, thing. And he asked the students, just as a test, a bunch of stuff about division, simple long division sort of things. And these are all kids who've gotten their, you know, uh, CBSC, ICSC, 95 plus percent, 97 percent, 99 percent, very high numbers, you know, all of this, this kind of stuff. Um, some like barely anyone in class managed because once you get deep into it, so of course they can fake it, right? Most of us can say these vague things. Oh, I understand this. I understand for maths this. I they can do fairly advanced stuff, but once you dig deep into it, even basic stuff like you know how what is a group, what is a ring, what is a field, what happens. What if you replace numbers with objects and treat them in a different way? Suddenly, people begin to fall apart. And that is because their mathematical foundations have just never been created. right? You just went to school and somehow learned enough to keep going up to the next exam. Um, that is a big problem in and of itself. We're trying our best to fix that. But you know, it, it, it is a sort of national scale problem. We're not going to succeed by ourselves. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit. Let me let me actually skip uh, this stuff. Uh, let me see. Hold on. I just stop sharing. I have a couple more things to say that are not uh, directly covered in my slides, and I see there is a huge number of questions. Um, I'll, I'll I'll have Medini. I'll, I'll I'll put this on you to. Uh, uh, go through the questions and ask me some of them. But I do want to mention two more things, and I'm almost exactly on time. I targeted 640 for this um, that I wanted to mention. First, in terms of comparison with a standard engineering degree, uh, this is a science degree, not an engineering degree. Uh, most engineering schools, if you're looking at, let's say, an IIT or something, you're still going in, and in your first year, there's a bunch of standard engineering style things that you're learning, right? If those are things you want to do, like drafting and so on and so forth, you want to take machine shop classes, welding, there's a, there's a bunch of standardized engineering things that you are required to do. Any of your parents or anyone here who's been to an IIT will know this, uh, but there's a standard set of engineering related objects that are taught at engineering schools. Ashoka is not an engineering school. We do not, as part of our vision, we do not plan to have an engineering school at Ashoka in the near future. Uh, part of that is because that's not a gap. We have 
fairly good engineering schools in our country. The problem is all the people who go through them tend to go into investment banking, to our research, and you know they, they tend to go into other areas. And that's why we have all our bridges and roads falling apart, right? All the kids who do civil engineering go into banking, engineering gone to right? And that is because we are failing entirely. We are using these engineering degrees as signals that this person is worth hiring. They're not an idiot. They'll do whatever you want them to do. They have general intelligence. And we're completely destroying the worth of that degree. We keep saying things like, oh, India has a demographic uh, advantage. We have this demographic dividend. What do we do with this dividend? We get our students to do useless, busy work. And we're wasting it as a nation. We don't have that much time. And one of the things that I at least am very, very, very passionate about is getting rid of a lot of these useless structures. And I'm sorry to my Ashoka University admins, I'm going to badmouth the UGC. They're basically useless. Um, what we have in India is a relatively faded higher education system. We have a lot of students who are struggling who think they're not very clever when they are really clever. And uh, the ones who are supposedly succeeding are simply the ones who managed to game the system sufficiently. And we are squandering these opportunities because somehow people are getting through them and then they're going abroad. And one of the things that places like Ashoka, and there are many more like us coming up, because people have noticed this, uh, that we're trying to do is encourage students to follow their own strengths learn by themselves, provide sufficient ground level, hardcore, proper scientific support to them so they can, they can do it, right? This does not mean, oh, I want to do this thing. You go ahead and do this thing and you don't learn anything. No, that's not how it works, right? If someone wants to do poetry, fine, but you're gonna do it properly. You're gonna learn a lot while doing it. It is incredibly hard stuff, right? You, you wanna, work on AI-based art, that's fine. Here, take two years worth of fairly difficult AI courses so that you know what you're doing. And Maiden is smiling because that's kind of the stuff that she's interested in. Um, you have to do a lot of hard work before you can get into this other stuff. The reason being that if you don't do that, well, all you manage is some wishy-washy nonsense, right? And the next time the layoffs come, if you do wishy-washy nonsense, you're the one who's out. So it is critically important we build up this core of competence, people who know what they're doing and who love their jobs. Hopefully, we're sort of at Ashoka, we're taking the first few steps towards being able to do that. Whether we succeed or not, the coming decades will tell. All right. Um, so Medini. Go ahead. Let's hear some of these questions. Um, so one common question is actually someone has asked that they're working on sort of a personal project and they wish to raise funds and they want to know how Ashoka can help um, by providing them the right opportunities. But I also wanted to add um, sort of a side question that people are asking is how can people get into these kind of research or other project opportunities at Ashoka? Okay, so two things. Um, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship side things. We have a full entrepreneurship center. I'm also working with some people. Um, I can't say the name. They're one of the biggest VCs in the world. I'll tell you that much. Uh, in setting up uh, an innovation hub at Shoka. It's meant to be this like, we're getting the building in September. We're putting up uh, a sort of five-story building where you, know, you can come in on the ground floor, discuss ideas. There's a maker space on the next floor. You go build stuff. Then we sort of help you with your business plan. We're creating this entire funnel from ideation to business, right? Most business schools, what they're not most non business schools, most incubators, and we've been to a lot of them. I was on a sort of flash tour of the US going, visiting a bunch of these incubation centers, Penovations, ELC, ID, MIT's Deshpande Lab, and so on. Um, they require you to come in with ideas, right? You come in with a business plan, you come in with a program. No, no, no. We're, we're, we're starting at the random conversation between two people level. We're helping you build those initial objects all the way up to having some office space. So this is still being literally built. Uh, but by the time you lot come in and graduate, we'll have some pretty interesting stuff going on. Okay. Um, in terms of 
the second question, which is if you have plans to do research, come talk to us. There's a bunch of professors, hundreds of us at Ashoka. Uh, we love doing research. That's why we got into this field. We have plenty of funding from various sources, uh, government, uh, private sources, local and international. Come talk to us. We will look you in. Um, another question that people have is that they, they haven't done computer science in school, but they're really passionate about doing it in college. So they want to know how CS is taught at Ashoka from the base. That'll be fine. It's taught completely from scratch. We do generally prefer that students have some mathematical background. Uh, but even if you don't, then the, the, there's an official document about it uh, that you can read up and you can contact me if you want to get a copy of that document. Um, or you can contact uh, the university administration. Um, you can, even if you don't have math, you can still sort of take a test, not, not really a test. You can take certain courses to make up for that. Um, but uh, you should be fine. Even if you haven't done a single line of coding in your life before this, you can completely do a degree in CS. Um, just to add on to that, um, everyone, I also didn't have computer science in school. I started from Ashoka itself. So I think it's perfectly okay. They start from the basics with, you know, computer introduction to computer programming and so on. Um, another question that I see is, um, how do you decide on the combination of subjects? Um, I, I can take that up if that's okay. Um, the foundation courses are actually um, built to do that. So you have certain foundation courses and then you can choose your subjects post that. So a lot of questions are also asking, should I do a major or a minor interdisciplinary? All of that is sort of, that will help you figure that out. Um, another question that's there is, um, they want to know about the internship opportunities at Ashoka. Uh, depends at what level. So uh, the way this generally works is that a fair number of our students um, towards their later years, uh, they, 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 they start coming to people like me saying, hey, I want to apply for internships. Should I go to the placement cell? Uh, should I do this? Should I do that? Generally speaking, a fair number of them end up doing their internships with uh, me or one of their professors for a research project. Right. I do encourage them to do that. Uh, the reason being is that, unfortunately, this is by virtue of our physical location in India. Um, I, I'm sorry I've been back saying India for so much. I love India. It's a, I came back to this country because I love it. Okay, <laughs> but, uh, but it is a, an unfortunate fact that uh, internships in India are very often for undergraduate internships not useful. OK, they'll make you sit there and write some Excel sheets because they don't trust this random intern to do any important work. Uh, so unless there's there's some subset of students who get good internships, you know, with Microsoft or Google or whatever. And, you know, there, there's there's a bunch every year. There's we, we have a relatively small batch. So this time our ASP, the, the fourth year batch that came out was a couple about a dozen people, I guess. Um, in th uh, because we have this three plus one year structure, although with NEP, there is going to be a four year structure um, next year on UG 25, 26 onwards, I believe. So uh, we, we are going to have this four year structure. At that point in time, I expect about 50, 60 people per batch. But even with our, out of 10 people, we'll have three people, two, three people, you know, two going to Microsoft, one or two going to Google. So about half of them will have sort of these high quality internships somewhere or the other. Uh, for the remaining, I actually highly, highly, highly encourage them, even though they'll apply to companies and get, you know, some internship I won't name. Obviously, if I'm thinking, naming these places as bad companies, I'm not, not going to name them. Uh, but they're thinking, oh, I'll go do a summer internship there. I actually strongly usually tell them to do a summer school at some international institute. There's plenty of funding available for that sort of thing uh, or to do a research internship, because what that allows me to do is, especially for the students who are going to pursue higher studies, um, it, it makes for a much better recommendation letter. If I'm writing a letter of recommendation for someone and they've just taken two, three courses with me, I mean, what will I say? 
this student was diligent, they attended the courses, they did well. If they have worked on me with on a particular project, that gives me a lot of meat to work with when I'm writing that letter, right? So I hope that sort of more or less answers that question around internships. Um, another question, it's about the research project itself. They want to know if uh, you ha they have to sort of join existing projects so if they can pitch their own ideas and you know, stuff like that. Oh, you can totally pitch your own ideas. So the, 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 there are pros and cons. If it's an existing large project, chances are that it's funded, right? So I will have funding from some of these whatever big companies or from the government to pursue certain projects. Now, if you join one of those projects, it means that let's say you want to do a summer internship, then it's easy for me to pay you salary. It's easier for me to, let's say, if you say that, oh, for this project, I need to buy ABCD kinds of electronics or whatever, it's easier for me to get you that money. Um, if you want to pitch something, then that's a slightly different kind of thing. Your budget may be more constrained because I will have, you know, all the professors uh, will have a certain amount of miscellaneous funding. We have faculty grants for every single Ashoka faculty, a uh, few lakhs. And they may give you some of that money to start doing that research. Uh, but as you start getting deeper into it, we'll raise funding, we'll go out, we'll write grants and so on and so forth. So lots of people pitch their own projects and many of those things have done very, very well. Um, I see a lot of questions on the selection criteria and the company. By the way, as people are writing questions, it would be good to know uh, when you write a question, just note whether you are a student or a parent. That would be super useful. Sorry, please go ahead. I interrupted. Um, no, so about this, the selection criteria and the companies, um, everyone, you can also get in touch with the um, career development office and you know the admissions office for details about this. Um, computer science specific questions, I think we can take up right now. Um, I didn't, I, I think I lost the connection for a second there. Could you just repeat what you just said? No, um, there's no question. I was just saying that um, specific admission related process, process related questions they can take up with the admission. Sure, 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 sure. Um, Go ahead. Any other questions that are there? I think most of them have seemed to be covered. How do collaborations that Ashoka has with universities abroad work? Sure. There are multiple different kinds. Um, there are also a lot of them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of put them in some general umbrellas. Generally speaking, there's one set of uh, collaborations that have to do with studying abroad. So a fair number of our students uh, end up doing a semester abroad somewhere, right? It's not a majority, but again, it's a sizable minority of students who end up taking, if they're doing four years, they'll do one of their semesters abroad at one of these partner universities. That's fairly common. Uh, the second type of collaboration we have are these research collaborations. So we'll have researchers and speakers who will interact with us. Uh, so, and, and these are mainly for advanced courses. So let's say there's some advanced bio course where we are working on a particular kind of tuberculosis, right? So it's a graduate course with a few undergraduates in there. And that may be, let's say, co-taught by someone from King's College London and someone from Ashoka. And there are students there and there are students here. So co-taught courses and things like that, that there are uh, certain kinds of collaborations of that variety. Now, the, the example I gave you is not a real one. That's something we are hoping to set up pretty soon. We've been having some discussions. Uh, but, but those are the kinds of things that we have with a bunch of other places. There's also a bunch of uh, direct research related things where we have research projects where there are PIs or principal in investigators from both places. Um, these involve our professors and students going abroad, spending a sort of research semester there and so on and so forth, and them coming here. There's a lot of exchange-related activities that do occur at the research level. Um, 
outside of all of this we do have a couple of things happening uh, regarding uh, sort of co-branded degrees sort of where you get sort of multiple institutions names on your degrees and so on and so forth uh, but the best person for that instead of me commenting something ridiculous is to reach out to uh, the appropriate office at Ashoka um, that's run by uh, uh, an incredibly talented person by the name of Vanita Shastra. So you can look up her profile, you can look up that office, and there will be details about a lot of these collaborations online on the Ashoka website. Um, some people have questions about the Ashoka Scholars Program and how that sort of translates to the four years plus going to applying to a master's program as well. So uh, you should treat it as a standard for your program. In fact, next, this coming years onwards, if, if you're coming into Ashoka right now, that is basically going to get subsumed into the standard uh, because it's, it's not our decision or anything. India as a country with the new education policy is standardizing things. I think it's an excellent idea, by the way, into this four-year standardized degree format. Uh, so you will be encountering only the standardized four-year degree. There will be exits in between, but the degree will be designed as a four-year degree, not a three plus one. The three plus one was there because of a multitude of background reasons. But again, even then it was designed essentially as a four-year degree with an exit at the third year. And the reasons behind that go back into sort of uh, bureaucratic tussles, shall we say, around us wanting a four-year degree because that standard if you wanted to do a master's or a phd abroad you needed that four years of post-secondary school education whereas in india you had this british colonial three-year degree in place for a very long time and this was sort of a structure put in place to take care of that but now fortunately because the indian government has decided to move forward with its nep vision uh, we can move to the proper four-year degree. Um, uh, there's actually a lot of interest in the kind of research projects in computer science that are being done. And there's also a question that I wanted to add to this, that data science is taking over the narrative in general. So maybe we can talk a bit about the data science-related research projects as well. Sure. So <laughs> the problem with talking about research projects is there's a lot of them, right? Um, we have a fair number of people right now, you know, uh, the office next to mine is uh, PPD's Partha Pratim Das. He's used to be from IIT Kharagpur. He's here now. There's also uh, Maya Ramanath, who is, uh, who's here from IIT Delhi. Uh, they are some of the best people in data science in India right now. And uh, we have a large number of projects. We're building some incredible uh, data pools, including ones for healthcare data and so on and so forth. Um, you can look up their profiles and learn more about them. You can check out our website, cs.ashoka.edu.in for the computer science degree. Um, but maybe I can tell you a little bit about uh, one piece of data science that I've been working on, right? Just as an example. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just holding up a random tripod I had next to me. Um, this, uh, so we've been working, there's a, another professor here called Gotham Menon, and he's uh, one, one of India's best uh, epidemiologists. And uh, around the time COVID broke out, we, we'd already been starting thinking about building a, a large scale, what is known as an agent-based model. And what this means is if you've ever played a strategy uh, game, you know, like, uh, uh, Starcraft, or for those of you who are old school, Age of Empires or something, you know, dots moving around on a map sort of thing. Um, we wanted to build India. So 1.37 billion dots moving around on a realistic map of India, uh, where obviously these, are, these have to be hyper-realistic, right? Without the visualization, obviously. Um, so you need like a database with 1.3 billion rows you know, this is a person, this is their height, and this is synthetic data that is generated using machine learning uh, from reverse engineering real world surveys and so on and so forth. Um, we built it, it's running right now. We have a baby supercomputer sitting downstairs. Uh, this is uh, 
This was funded by the Gates Foundation and by the Emphasis F1 Foundation. Um, it's being used by multiple researchers around the world. We're writing this up. This right now is the planet's largest uh, agent-based model, right? The next one is more than an order of magnitude away. Uh, we're building sim similar populations for the US right now. And why is this important? It's important because now we have the ability to simulate and run queries, which are, uh, and for those of you who are parents who have some computer science background, it, it's an interesting data structures question as well. What we're building towards in the next generation of this is the ability to write uh, geographical and time traveling queries. I want to be able to ask, how many women live in India who are between the ages of 21 and 29 who, who have homes within one kilometer of a river, who work in the agriculture industry, and whose mothers were from Himachal Pradesh and had tuberculosis, right? So I'm moving across populations, geography, and time when making these kinds of queries. And this is not the sort of thing that exists pretty much anywhere else ever. Uh, we're building these systems. We've been working in collaboration with a company called ThoughtWorks to really make this uh, really, really high quality and not just a research artifact that is unusable. And there's loads of these kinds of projects going on all over the place. So if you if you find this sort of thing inspiring, check out um, TCPD, the Trivedi Center for Political Data, as well as the, well, now it's the School of Economics. Uh, we have uh, some fantastic work being done by CEDA, uh, and uh, this is Ashwini Deshpande and group who are doing some really great work with economic data. Um, yeah, we've pretty much covered all of the questions, but if anyone has anything else, they can definitely reach out to us. Um, there was one question um, asking if I could talk about the research projects I've taken up. Um, I won't go into the depth. I'll very briefly just tell that um, I'm also working with I'm also working with Professor Devan, and there's a lot of interdisciplinary research being done that I've been able to be a part of, uh, including machine learning, using um, network analysis on the internet to figure out if a certain um, media house is talking in a different way about a certain you know news event, or even, for example, in healthcare, making a web app that makes healthcare data accessible. So just sort of a little bit about these bio, um, sociology, economics, sort of related interdisciplinary projects that are being done. But yeah, we're pretty much done with the questions. Okay, cool, fantastic. It was great to be here. Uh, if you all have any other questions, you'll see there's, there's some stuff that has been shared on the chat. Please, please, please do feel free to reach out to us through those mechanisms. Um, you can also uh, write to us directly. So if uh, you can check out our computer science website, let me just also post a link to that. Um, just, uh, so if uh, the webinar... Uh, uh, group, so I can only post to hosts and panelists. So if the webinar group can just post to the attendees, if you could repost that link, that would, I would be very grateful. Um, thank you. Uh, so you can check out that website. You'll find my email. You'll find out all the other people that we've been talking about. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I hope you enjoyed being part of our discussion on computer science at Ashoka. Um, before we wrap up the session, we would really appreciate if you could please take a minute to share your valuable feedback with us. The link to the feedback form is provided in the chat box, I believe. Uh, please note that the recording of this session will be available on Ashoka's YouTube channel in case you'd like to share it with your friends. A few last points before we wrap up today's session. I would also like to inform our audience that round three applications for the undergraduate program are open. You can secure your admission even without 12 board marks or CUEP. The last date to submit your application in this round is 15th April. Students and parents can visit Ashoka University for a campus tour as well, and the link to register for the campus tour is provided in the chat box. 
if you have any further queries regarding various other aspects of the university, feel free to write to us at ugapply at ashoka.edu.in or call on the number shown on your screen. Once again, I thank you all for taking our time to participate in this discussion. This brings us to the end of this session. Please take care and stay safe.